Thanks so much, Scott, for the invitation. It's fantastic to be here. This is my first time in Atlanta, I'll have to uh, confess. Um, so in 2004, when Mimi and I were standing inside our um, completed Bamboo Canopy MoMA PS1, we asked ourselves, is it really complete? Um, or was it, in fact, the state of incompletion that excited us, that opened up new possibilities in our minds? Was it the elusive or ambiguous status um, that encouraged users, or misusers as we began to call them, that allowed them to appropriate this intervention as their own? So as we continued to work on ephemeral environments and pavilions and so on, in parallel with our more uh, regular commissions, um, we became increasingly fascinated with the formal and social potential of the incomplete and in ambiguous as a broader approach for architecture. So these projects in our minds, they delineate rather than clearly establish distinctions between architecture and landscape or architecture in the city. They respond to environmental conditions such as the wind. They generate microclimates rather than establishing clear environmental um, separations. Perhaps they even change color with the seasons. But all, all of them, in our minds, resisted programmatic determinism and invited misusers. So we came to believe that these qualities, um, incomplete, appropriated by users, ambiguous, in fact, could be somehow a goal to aspire to in general in architecture. So this seemingly diminished kind of space, um, we began to think of as an almost building. And we saw this as a kind of provocation that sort of destabilized in our minds the definition of what, you know, what is exactly a building as a clearly um, delineated entity. So this interest set up for us a kind of curious or uh, paradoxical inversion of priorities. On the one hand, with our installations, we tried to make them as building-like as possible, as young architects trying to get it to look like a building. But conversely, we started making our more, you know, permanent commissions for designs for public spaces and housing and other buildings as almost building-like as possible. So we're interested in this crossover. So the almost building is somehow incomplete, something missing, something lacking, like a proper boundary between spaces, between building and not building. The almost building invites appropriation, misuse, misuse by the public, bringing the public realm into the private realm, or the city into the home, or the random into the organized. It celebrates misuse of its intended function, it subverts hierarchies. And this is uh, the artist Nina Kachadurian who, uh, during her airplane rides, messes with airplane magazines, putting her uh, peas on top of the airplane magazine. The almost building is comfortable in its ambiguity, using reflectivity, scalar shifts, um, reframing strategies to disguise its limits and to incorporate the context within itself. So we view this expanded notion of a building territory as an opportunity to remix site elements um, and create a new context, a new lens through which to look at our built environment. What our interest in this ambiguity in architecture stems from a goal to achieve a kind of multiplicity of readings or perceptions in, in the work of architecture that arises from a kind of unfolding, dynamically unfolding perception of architectural space. And this focus on um, ambiguity for us is grounded in the architectural element and its capacity for uh, reformulation into new organizational logics and experiences. So for us, the element, once displaced, um, opens up the possibility not only of its renewal, but also an expansion from constituent part to ordering system. So rather than a fragment or a displaced fragment, we view the element as uh, reframed either as a dominant idea or, or a spatial structure. So the arch, and this is alphabetical, but don't worry, I'm not going through the whole alphabet. <laughs> the arch regulates space, typically supports, communicates weight. Um, what if the arch can become a kind of a network of arches producing a deep landscape? What if the heavy masonry arch is replaced with lightweight splines, um, defining microenvironments without hard boundaries? The bay window is a product of part 19th century um, real estate feature as well as uh, an urban street front articulation, what if this uh, outward projection of interior space could become uh, inhabitable as a kind of furniture built into the facade? The floor, just to be very simple about it, functions as an object, right? Uh, designates location, divides space vertically. What if one could regulate floor to floor heights to adapt to varying demographics and provide a kind of Compensation for interior space in exchange for views. The portal, 
um, we were very interested in the portal in Dutch 17th century paintings in the way that it produces a kind of a mysterious um, sense of alternation of interior and exterior, mystery and depth. What if the whole building can function as a portal, a portal to the site, and in this case to the 1650s Dutch farmhouse operating at the scale of a building? Pitched or flat? That's always the question. What if we could do both? The um, pitched roof, you know, addresses zoning, environmental criteria, inserts a building within a long genealogy, in this case of housing. Meanwhile, the flat roof achieves the kind of modernist aspiration of occupiable exterior space. What if we could have both? Skylight, instead of just simply thinking of it as a kind of amplification of um, the role of interior, int introducing daylight into, and its exterior views into interior space, what if it could remix those views as we did in this case with a mirror creating a periscope? The stair is a connection, a um, theater potentially, uh, a stage, an overlook. What if we could modulate between all these conditions and provide in this time of speed a kind of slowness that continues to open up possibilities for social interaction and, and the theatrics of public life? The tower, rather than think of it as an urban element, what if we think of it as an architectural element where we can kind of insert our work within a broader um, urban condition as a kind of microcosm of that condition? In Chicago Navy Pier, we made, played a sort of joke where we made a tower that from the foreground looks as if it's part of its borrowed neighboring context, but when you step back, you realize it's only 45 feet tall. So can the tower, for instance, be an element that creates this sort of ambiguous reading of scale? Does the vault have to be heavy, heavy masonry, or can we think of them in a different way, uh, in a thinner way, to allow further transformation, reformulation into a network of continuously unfolding spatial conditions? The party wall, does it have to divide neighbors, registering the separate lives within its narrow depth, or can we reframe a party wall as a dynamic instigator of exchange? And finally, the wall. Again, the wall accumulates this patina through age and misuse. When we build with them again, can we retain some of that, as we did in a uh, recently completed project in New York? And one more wall. Walls, heavy walls, in this case in the south of France where we built an installation a long time ago, protecting the inhabitants with, from the fierce winds. Could the wall, in fact, be a nebulous kind of network that, that it moves with the wind? So during this process, we've been taking these elements, transforming them, with simultaneous goals of maintaining the legibility, but also introducing them as new conceptual spatial frameworks for our architecture. So that the element is no longer merely understood as a defined physical object, but in fact, for us, it's kind of an open-ended building block uh, into the architectural imagination. So I'm gonna show 13 projects produced over 13 years. That's just a coincidence. We've been around for 17, so that would probably be a lot of projects. Um, so in the beginning, um, 2004, um, what well, we'd been practicing for almost five years, we got two uh, very sort of important breaks. We considered this pair to be the grandpa and the grandma of, of our firm, kind of, because not only did they happen at the same time and were they kind of amazing opportunities, but they also, in a sense, established or set up a kind of parallel sets of ways of working in the city that we've been pursuing ever since. So on the one hand, you know, commissions for buildings um, and some of them housing, for instance. And on the other hand, working in, in public space, either with public spaces themselves or, or buildings that, that sort of operate within public space and um, cultural context. And we've continued uh, that sort of thinking from PS1 um, to a project I'll show you as well in, in Taiwan, Forest Pavilion, and also last year at the Milan Triennale, where we experimented with, again with vaults, um, but not bamboo, this time in, in aluminum. So switch building was born out of kind of a funny um, moment where a potential client walked in off the street. We were sharing with Lucer Mackey Lewis and other, other folks in the Lower East Side storefront and he said, I have a, you know, an open plot of land and I want to build a six-story um, stainless steel clad building. He had all the kind of um, lists of that you know, developers have of attributes, like I want bay windows, I want balconies, I want wine coolers, I want all this. So we very quickly um, kind of developed an approach to the project in which these would be integrated into some kind of system 
um, allowing for the kind of repetition and the efficiency of repetition that, that he needed, while also allowing for variation, which is one of our big interests, for basically uh, you know, to accommodate a variety of different users. So we designed a six-story building with a gallery on the ground floor, the front facade of which is considered a kind of uh, inhabitable facade in which the bay windows, which again historically have been um, you know, uh, present throughout the Lower East Side but have kind of disappeared, appear again. Um, since we were allowed to basically project within our own property, there was a five-foot setback. And we also then thought of the, uh, the ground floor as an inversion of this condition, kind of a bay window that you walk into in reverse um, as you kind of enter into the, the art gallery. So another thing we try to integrate in the facade, rather than think of them as kind of elements that you kind of just locate, was, uh, the, were the, um, the grills, the air conditioning grills, which um, are basically uh, concealed within these sort of uh, fins, louvers, like kind of like the gills of a fish. But they're very standard um, PTAC units, packaged thermal AC units that every developer you know, uses, and they live behind this, this screen. In our minds, the bay windows would allow for some kind of view up and down the street, so that you're not simply looking you know, um, directly at, at the building across. And we carried this idea of the switching of back and forth, um, which led to the project's name, into the rear facade, where we thought, well, if you just switch the balconies, you get a double height, and in fact, maybe you make friends with your neighbors. Um, so as it happened, two sisters bought adjacent apartments. Perhaps it's a very unique um, demographic. Meanwhile, almost at the same time, we were building this bamboo canopy in PS1. Um, for those of you who maybe don't know it, it's an annual competition for young architects to design and build an installation in this 30,000 square foot um, courtyard. Um, this was our competition physical model, and for students in the audience, this was built with cane, um, kind you, you make wicker chairs out of. So we, we saw the kind of the possibility to kind of create a very kind of integrated, what we call deep landscape, something to unify the way you sit, the way you look at the sky, and all the sort of microclimates that we then um, implemented from the very dry, sandy condition on the right to a pool pad, to a fog pad, and a rainforest with, with, with some nozzles. Um, the idea was really to create a kind of very cohesive environment with a three-dimensional three network of bamboo, in this case, which we found was very flexible uh, material. And this is Sam from our office testing three poles of bamboo lashed together with stainless steel wire, um, totaling 60 feet. Another interest in working with the living material for us was this sort of uh, uncertainty about how it would look uh, as it evolved uh, through, with time. So we, this is our competition image. We projected that by the end of the summer, it would be uh, bone white. And in fact, at the beginning of the summer, it was still quite green, really lovely to touch. And by the end of the summer, it really did you know, become very, very, very white. So the, the sort of brevity of the project was underscored, in a sense, by the, the transformation of material. Um, for us, it was really important that this project would function in a crowd of 7,000 people, where you have you know, DJs and, and, and bands and so on, um, as much as it would function with smaller groups, um, or, or nobody, just one person, or families on Sundays. So it was important, again, that it had this kind of capacity to be comfortable and accept people and uh, allow them to appropriate it without determining exactly how they should sit, hence the kind of very simple flat decks. Um, but then by using misting systems and so on, we created different, um, basically, levels of comfort um, that would attract people to different things. So it developed for us a kind of an approach to an open-ended um, architecture as an armature for social interaction, rather than thinking of it simply as a series of um, objects, elements, or effects. Um, seven years later, in Taiwan, we were invited to, to design or to build a, a sculpture. And we said, well, we're not artists, we're, we're architects, can we do something useful? So we proposed to create a little pavilion in the middle of this beautiful area of uh, eastern Taiwan called Hualien, where um, basically the government was trying to promote its low carbon footprint uh, approach by preserving this big forest. And this art festival was meant to kind of, you know, raise awareness about the forest and prevent local casino developers from, from transforming the area. So we had a very flat site, and we really thought, well, maybe the, the vault will be the strongest and simplest way to create a sense of enclosure. Um, we also learned that the local people, the Amis, as, as they're called, they're non-Han Han Chinese, 
and there are many, many different kinds of, uh, of Amis and, tr and groups of them. They all tell their story through uh, dance and, um, and singing. So we decided, well, let's create a kind of a band shell, but one for every, every member of, you know, one for every sort of uh, group and bring them together into a circular stage. So we became very interested in the idea of a non-hierarchical um, performance space where rather than as I am standing here now uh, with you guys sitting there, we would set up a kind of a, um, a, a sort of a non, a, a polycentric kind of theater where, you know, performance could either occur in the middle or on the edges, on the periphery, or performances could in fact um, be understood in different ways um, relative to the opportunities of the piece. And it was great, the, the, these are photos from the um, closing ceremony, although it lasted a couple more years after it closed. I guess they kept it, kept it up, it withstood many typhoons, um, in which you know, performers, in this case, occupied the periphery, uh, along with uh, spectators, but we also saw performances um, you know, that occurred in the middle, so it's really interesting just to see how the curators or the choreographers appropriated the space Just last year, we were invited to um, design a pavilion for a piece for the Milan Triennale. It's one of 14 architects looking at different kind of elements in architecture. And we were actually assigned roof, although we didn't find this out until the opening. We saw the title roof on our project. Um, uh, and so in this case, we thought, you know, we really want to redo a smaller version of, of Taiwan. But in this case, we again wanted to think about how we can take the simple element of the vault and begin thinking of it not as an element so much as this opportunity for a, a node in a network. So we were looking at historically, you know, evolution of vaults and thought about a few different kinds, the skewed barrel vault, which we had done uh, before, the split vault, a reverse split vault, which is actually what we ended up using, and the sort of one to two vault. So after many studies with a relatively tight budget, we um, designed a small pavilion um, using aluminum, and given the uh, tight budget, we had to work with five millimeters, which is somewhere between an eighth and a quarter inch, right? Uh, five millimeters of aluminum that would span about 15 feet. So we worked with uh, engineers uh, in New York to optimize the strength of the material through its deformations. And again, given the very tight budget, we had to really cover a lot of space with just a very little material. But the ideas are very similar to the, those of our forest pavilion in Taiwan. A central space, a deck, and um, some kind of, uh, you know, activation of the, the courtyard that it sits within. So these vaults are kind of incredible. They're, it's very flimsy material, but somehow by twisting it into certain curvatures, we were able to work with engineers to limit deflection, the natural frequency, which was the limiting factor, and, and, and other structural kind of engineering factors, given the potential for high winds in Milan. So uh, it worked, it, it, it lasted, and it um, <laughs> didn't fall down, even though it really was very flimsy. And um, we worked with two sides of uh, the material, the reflective side and the kind of sandblasted side, uh, alternating these to create a kind of dynamically unfolding perception of the space as you, as you move around. And of course, kids loved it. We took our own kids there this last summer to enjoy it. The, the next uh, pair of projects um, really th thinks about the difference between thinking about micro to macro and macro to micro. Um, on the one hand, Carmel Place, which Scott mentioned, it's a micro unit uh, building, really uh, posed the question for us as to how do these very small spaces have larger, broader impacts, whether it's on policy or the city at large. Um, and conversely, in Chicago Navy Pier, where we're faced with a very large area, um, and a limited sort of uh, set of opportunities in terms of what we could, how we could intervene. We had to think in a sort of acupunctural sense, how could a series of um, interventions really activate a very, very large area, so ma macro to, to micro. Um, there's a sort of epilogue project to Carmel, which is um, a tower we're building in Hong Kong, which I'll, which I'll show you a few images of. Um, so Carmel Place um, was born out of a competition held by then Mayor Bloomberg's administration to design and build the first um, micro-unit apartment building in, in New York. And it's um, basically the challenge was, you know, just, just do it, uh, design it, build it, operate it. So we were part of a team led by a developer who invited us to, to join the competition. Um, and it was a very challenging competition because, you know, they, they relaxed certain, um, some rules, some zoning uh, resolutions, um, but they basically didn't give any other guidelines. So they um, 
relax the minimum density, which is the number of apartments you can fit in one building, and the minimum area for a unit. Other than that, we had to kind of think about it ourselves. So New Yorkers dream about big spaces, but make it in microspaces. Was, this was our kind of uh, competition entry thinking. Um, we've adapted to New York in the sense that there are lots of illegally subdivided apartments where you may have um, a window to a wall or no window or and no security. Um, and, and so now it's time that New York adapts to us. So when Jacob Rees documented the um, plight of the urban poor in the turn of the 20th century, his photographs galvanized the civic action to basically introduce new legislation that would improve light and air and, and humane living conditions. So since the overcrowding of the tenements, the average home size in the United States has really kind of ballooned, um, peaking in fact just, just before the crash in 2007. Apparently it's back up again. Um, but the irony of this is that it's sort of been an inverse demographic trend, which is that we are less and less uh, nuclear families. And in New York City, only 18% of, of the uh, residents are fit, fit into that group. Um, actually, Atlanta is right behind Manhattan uh, in terms of the number of single persons uh, in, in households. And it's a trend that, if you look at it globally, is, is definitely um, it's, it's basically prevalent throughout the developed world. And it's expected to really increase in the developing uh, BRIC countries, especially. Um, so the options really are: you know, do you have an illegal sublet, or do you move out to the suburbs, um, or do we find ways to kind of maintain the vitality of our cities? So this was the Adapt NYC competition's goals, and this image is taken from um, a sp uh, a, this is a photo at the Center for Architecture, the AIA Center for Architecture in New York, which held an exhibition called Making, um, which, which held an exhibition. There's another exhibition called Making Room at the Museum of the City of New York. But this is a, a large body of research basically presented to all the um, um, comp competition teams. So it was announced in 2013 that we won. Um, and our building basically tried to address a, a series of scales from the scale of the community to, to that of the micro unit itself. And always thinking about how we can further kind of refine this idea of scale. So even within the unit, um, there are two different flooring materials that tries to create an illusion of more space. The building itself is sort of conceived of as a kind of a, um, microcosm of the city skyline, again trying to give expression to a new prototype for, for the city. Um, it's sort of like David and Goliath, but you can probably see our building down there, the little white one. It's in a site surrounded by very, very tall buildings. Um, we actually thought our building should be taller to sort of fit better into the context, but the city would not provide any extra uh, FAR, that's buildable area. Um, so we, we did what we could. But we tried to think of it as a kind of a, a, um, a hinge between different kind of uh, contextual conditions. So the, um, the building is comprised of, is, is clad in brick, and there's a range of brick color from a kind of a white to a very dark gray that tries to fit within the, you know, the different cacophony of different brick colors that are on the site. But it's really conceived of as four micro towers. Um, this slip and kind of allow sort of different readings as you as you sort of walk around um, the site. Um, there are 55 units. There are rental apartments. They range from 260 square feet to 360 square feet net. Um, they're all accessible. 40% uh, of them are affordable, in quotes. This is kind of open for discussion, and you'd be shocked at the cost of living in New York if I told you the prices. And 60% are our market rate. Um, it was a very challenging building to, to build uh, because of the um, complex, very small site and uh, some kind of very new challenges that no one had really faced before. Inherent to uh, modular construction in a two hour fire rated uh, building at this height. So it was kind of an incredible uh, experiment at multiple levels for us and our development part, uh, developer partners at Manavik. We began to think of the home as a potentially dispersed home, something that we think uh, we're going to see more and more in the future. This idea that we live not necessarily only in our units, but we are increasingly sharing um, whether it's amenities or workspaces or mobility um, throughout the, the city. And uh, we think it's just the beginning of that. To a certain extent, uh, we've been able to introduce a lot of public spaces in, or shared spaces in the, in the building relative to um, rental apartment buildings. Um, and these are in the sort of the best spots of the building. On the ground floor, there's a, a gym and a cafe leading to the, um, the street. And on the uh, setback floor, there's a, a sort of shared amenity space um, where uh, any residents can hold parties and so on. 
the ground floor itself is sort of considered as an urban suite, and the lobby being oversized so that it can host a dinner uh, with everybody in the building, like up to 100 people. The idea being that if you can just convert uh, necessary uh, spaces, like a corridor, to something that you know, can really evolve, could, could it then be really used all, all the time? Uh, also, the gym is on the ground floor, which is kind of the, the best spot at the view of the park. Um, there's the lobby of the street, looking out to a small garden that's not planted yet. So the construction was kind of unique. Um, we built it with steel frame modules built in the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard and transported across the Manhattan Bridge to the, to the site. There are 65 modules um, and about, uh, I can't remember exactly how many types, but we had a variety of types of apartments, apartment units, this being a corner, corner unit, um, which really kind of within the very narrow spectrum of the idea of a micro unit or studio, still provided a range of options to, for different, for different uh, renters. Um, the really exciting part was stacking it, which uh, took three and a half weeks, um, the setting process. Um, of course, the building took uh, the same time to build as any building at the end of the day for all kinds of reasons, but there's this moment where it was really going quite quickly. This is a typical floor plan uh, showing you the different modules. Um, we had many constraints to sort of consider with modular construction, which have to do with the phasing. So you'll see that each um, unit extends into the corridor a little bit, which allows the um, welding together of these modules um, under, and then the covering of that welding, welded scene with a carpet. Um, also, all the bathrooms, most of the bathrooms and utilities uh, basically had to f uh, face the, um, the corridors so that we could have those finished at the end after, after the setting is complete. So here you see a typical floor, floor plan. It's a very small building uh, at some level. It's 45 foot by 105 foot site. Um, the building's about 33 or 30 something thousand square feet um, gross. Uh, we really ha had to pack everything in. In fact, we worked with an eighth inch tolerance, um, which is uh, made possible by the use of uh, modular construction. And this is because we were skating uh, on thin ice, basically, when it, in a regulatory sense. We were basically were pushing the limits of what could be uh, acceptable by, by code. Because of the small site, we were not allowed to extend our footprint um, that much. We were given a small, narrow override. Um, so if we had kind of introduced a larger tolerance, like half inch, or more standard construction tolerance, we would have lost a whole line of units, making the entire project unviable from the developer standpoint. So we really had to work with this kind of uh, very precise um, construction technique to, to make it all feasible. While the mayor's override relaxed a few criteria for us, like the minimum unit size, all the other ones still applied. So it had to be accessible. We had to have a minimum, minimal habitable area of 150 square feet in, in a living area. Uh, we had all the other same considerations. So this actually was a kind of very challenging to, to you know, to do because of this. Um, this is a typical unit. We tried to um, make them very uh, livable by increasing the ceiling height. This is why I was very concerned to have the um, projector give you the right proportions because it would look like the standard eight foot ceiling height if it were flat. But it's a nine foot eight ceiling height. And instead of windows, we introduced terrace doors uh, with a structural glass back um, um, balcony guard in front of it, like a Juliet balcony, so that you could really feel as if you're sort of outdoors uh, or somewhat outdoors when you when you open these sliding doors and turn your whole space into a sort of tempered environment. Um, with a lot of sort of overhead storage and built-in furniture, the um, unit really kind of uses every every square foot. Um, so we've heard residents say that you know it feels like a loft a little bit. I guess the fact that they also have um, you know, it's a variety of shared spaces makes, makes the building a lot more livable. So we became convinced that it's, you know, with certain uh, design approaches, you could make a space feel very much larger than it, than, it, than it is. And we also introduced several different unit types. This is a unit on the, on the corner. Um, and all of these work together um, as, I guess, New York City's first prototype. Now, they've changed the uh, zoning uh, regulations since this project, but they don't uh, still allow for a 100% micro-unit building. So this is the day of moving in, in last June, when re residents started moving into the building, um, captured by a filmmaker. And I guess it just you know, leaves us with the question, you know, how does this new building type fit in with this historical genealogy? Um, it's different from SROs or other sort of um, housing experiments, and yet it's, it's, fa it's familiar. Um, but mainly, we're, we're hoping that 
cities can begin adapting housing stock to, you know, to the changing demographics while maintaining kind of vital, you know, vital walkable cities. So we're still interested in, in this problem. It's clearly a challenging one. In Hong Kong, uh, we're building a tower um, with 250 units. It's, it's under construction right now. Um, these units are even smaller. Um, but it's a very different context in Hong Kong. Um, units of 150 square feet are not uncommon. Um, so we basically didn't invent that. Um, th there was a uh, article in the South China Morning Post, which is Hong Kong's uh, leading newspaper, about our Carmel Place project saying, New York architects bring Hong Kong style architecture to New York. And then the irony was that they hired New York architects to design Hong Kong style <laughs> apartments in Hong Kong. So these units are really small, but they have very tall ceilings, which allows for the construction of a second, a sort of a, a mezzanine level, a sleeping loft really, uh, to be more, more frank. Um, Every uh, unit has a balcony that has a kind of an angled mirror that will uh, reflect the, um, the context in a kind of unique way. We're excited to see how, how, that will, how that will work, both from the sense of pedestrians looking up, but also when you're inside your unit, getting kind of this expanded view. Hopefully more on that uh, in a year or two. So Chicago Navy Pier was also the uh, result of a competition that we um, one along with James Corner Field Operations, who was the design lead on the project. Um, so we were the architect um, and responsible for everything seen blue. <laughs> we, um, basically, the architectural structures on the pier. Um, the pier was designed as part of the Burnham's plan and was the only one built out of several that were um, projected. It was it was the people's pier. It really was a kind of uh, important element for Chicago. But lately, it had become very kind of tacky. Um, you know, amusement rides. Um, or rather the Ferris wheel, lots of boat rides. And for Chicagoans, you wouldn't even know you were on the lake. Um, lots of clutter, banners everywhere, uh, kiosks. So our job, in a sense, with, with James Corner was to sort of clean things up. And um, JCFO designed a, a really beautiful landscape. We introduced these different elements, this info tower, the upper left, the wave wall, which is sort of the biggest piece. Um, the bottom left, these lake pavilions, a series of four of them. and um, quite a lot of uh, kiosks that were kind of standardized that would sell food and beverage and so on. So this is our little joke on the Chicago skyline. It's a 45 foot tower that um, you can Instagram it and make it look as if you're part of the city. But it was our way of trying to bring the city to the, um, to the dock, to the pier, and not make it feel like a kind of an enclave, something that's kind of separate from the city. And in fact, um, the, the brief uh, for this piece wasn't to design a tower, it was to design a, a gate. And we resisted that. We said, you know, the gate will really make it feel like a privatized enclave, which it sort of is. It's a non-for-profit that runs the pier, but it's a highly commercialized place where you can drink a margarita uh, and walk around. Can I see a show of hands who's actually been to Navy Pier? Okay. <laughs> so you all, know, you, a lot of you know what it's like. I don't know if you've been there recently. Um, so we were interested in this tower to sort of play with uh, the perception and as, as you know the environment would change so there's a series of uh, different uh, glazing types with different concentrations of mirror that can, uh, basically create an, a very dynamically uh, evolving condition which is a strategy that we also um, apply to these very small kiosks which are made with uh, or clad in solid timber faced with a um, sandblast stainless steel on one side and it shifts so that when you walk um, to the pier you see as you see in the bottom of this one you'll see the metal side the wood above, but as you walk back, this will be sort of inverted. So even at that level, we wanted this constant, this constant change. Now for the lake pavilions, during the competition, this was our simple idea. Wouldn't it be great to just cut a piece of the lake and float, float it above? Um, perceptually, we wanted to connect Chicagoans to their lake. So in this case, we use reflectivity, um, a canopy, basically, that has um, a variety of modulations that kind of confound a little bit and remix, in a sense, the reflections of the lake. And, and, and those are the pier, and then also creates some very interesting kind of lighting effects. But it was a kind of a disobedient uh, uh, project because the, um, this canopy wasn't in, in the brief. They wanted kiosks, and we thought, well, why do we want more and more clutter? Why not join these two together and create a new public space that's shaded for you know discomfort? It gets really, really hot in Chicago, but also to um, allow for un un unanticipated events. Maybe they could be used for a wedding or you know. Um, performances, and, and that sort of happens. People hang out under the canopy. But mainly, we wanted to capture the beauty of the lake and just bring it bring it to the Chicagoans. 
Um, this is another element that was not in the, in the brief, our, our wave wall. The, the, the brief asked for ADA access, some kind of access to the existing upper, upper dock level, the plinth level, and, and we thought, well, ramps, ramps are not so great because you always have to move. Stairs are fantastic, you can sit, you can use them in different ways, and what if we create almost like an amphitheater and solve the issue of ADA with uh, elevators, quite simply, you see one in the background there. Um, so we proposed this wave wall, actually we proposed two, they let us do one, we're happy with that. But it's a very simple idea that, you know, let's bring the lake out, to, let's bring the, the plinth out to the lake and the, the park inwards. So basically it modulates from a condition of stair to overlook. It's simply, it's a, it's a stair basically that has a series of stringers. And in this case, this section is cut in the middle showing the ADA stair. But as it becomes steeper and steeper, um, it becomes a soffit or an overhang eave, allowing you know people to have a great view of the, um, the skyline or the lake. So the wave wall um, houses underneath it 30,000 square feet of retail, um, which we did not design the interiors of. But it's a very lightweight kind of screen uh, made of metal, um, prefabricated uh, panels um, that end up getting clad in, in ipe wood for, for the stair section. And this is not a rendering. This is actually a photograph of a uh, typical summer where they have um, you know, fireworks almost every week, it would seem. So it's become a kind of a you know, public space, and we're excited about that. So this next pair of projects um, it explores how architecture can respond to human interaction at different scales. Uh, on the left is uh, our party wall, an installation from 2005, really old project. Um, but we still show it because we're still interested in what it does. And that's a more one-to-one -one responsive interaction. On the right is a project that is still on the boards for us. We haven't um, begun construction. It's a series of urban kiosks in Seattle, on the waterfront in Seattle, where the sort of um, interactions with the public uh, really varies according to the, the sort of the urban scale. Um, so party wall asks the question again, like, you know, how can a party wall uh, connect rather than divide? Um, so we worked with an MIT Media Lab um, person to create an interactive installation that used proximity sensors to detect proximity up to about 80 centimeters and then trigger a kind of um, a, a servo motor to basically simply turn. And what it did was it basically brought together and apart a series of bands of foam creating connections um, between, between neighbors. It was kind of a Frankenstein. Um, we didn't have the budget to make it a sort of a networked network between the sensors. And we were surprised to see that that happened anyway through the foam. Basically, it would start moving and then it would trigger itself. Um, and then it would just go off for about 10 minutes until it would come to rest and then it would hiccup again and like wake up again. So it made us really re realize that interactivity doesn't have to be sort of one to one. Um, that we can kind of bring in the idea of indeterminacy into it. In Seattle, um, we're designing a series, we're in DD, or I think we finished DD on this. It's a very long project because they first have to sink the Alaskan Highway. Um, as you may know, they're digging a very big tunnel under the waterfront. We're again working with James Corner Field Operations on this. Um, the city asked us to make the, herb, the kiosks, which are really just food and beverage kiosks and information kiosks, as tall as possible <laughs> so that they could be visible from, from downtown. So these kiosks basically respond to the fact that, you know, Seattle, um, it's said that they have four seasons in one day in a kind of really dynamically changing environment. So we wanted the kiosk to reflect and recombine uh, images or reflections of the environment at large, on the sound, the skyline, and the bay, the promenade. So here you see in yellow um, the four kiosks that we're building. There may be a fifth. And they're placed basically at, at the sort of terminus of the major streets of Seattle so that one can, again, see the new waterfront, the proposed waterfront from, from afar. So we had to look a little bit at the sort of specific conditions of each one. But in the end, we decided to make them identical um, against some opposition from the city that had argued that really they should all be different to reflect the kind of different conditions. Because we were able to say, well, look, these um, kiosks, which kind of correct the view, as it were, because the slips, the piers, have been built at an angle to the city. We wanted to sort of allow people to actually see out um, 
to, to the sound. And the paradox is as you get closer and closer, you see less and less of, of, of the sound because of this orientation. Um, we wanted to say that, look, even though they're uh, all the same, they reflect very different things um, as you get closer. So this is um, University Street. And here you see the four different uh, conditions, same kiosk. Um, and this is the slide that convinced them. Here's the same kiosk. Let's uh, you know, move 15 feet over and see what it does. So it really changes uh, what, you, what you see. So we angled the mirror so that we could actually very specifically make connections to, to the peers and, and allow people to see each other. So who knows how long this project will still take uh, to build. And at night, it's, uh, they'll function as kind of uh, beacons in plan, they go from a kind of a basic square to, a, to a, just a sign, a diagonal um, blade at the top. So the next uh, pair of projects uh, looks at two very sort of disobedient projects. Um, the one is uh, still on the boards, even though we designed it in 2011. It's the Wyckoff House Museum for New York City's oldest um, uh, house or oldest structure. The, uh, you can see it through the portal. It's uh, the Wyckoff House from 1650. And a project we've just completed is about to be open to the public. It's called ADO. It's in, it's in Greenpoint. And both of these projects uh, emerge from a kind of another disobedience, as it were, um, elements that are not in the program. In this case, the void. So on your left, the Wyckoff House Museum is a portal to the old house. One doesn't actually have to visit our building. Uh, one can just you know, walk through it to, see, to, to go to the old house. And we wanted to basically honor the old house by framing it from its very kind of uh, busy context. On the right, ADO, um, we cut a corner out of the building and, and extended a kind of very uh, public void throughout the building that um, people can visit. So the Wyckoff House is, as I said, the oldest structure in New York State, dating from 1652. It's the first building that Landmarks Preservation Commission designated as a landmark upon formation of the LPC in 1968. So in other words, a hot potato. Um, and we actually uh, obtained Landmarks approval for, for our building. Um, by basically arguing to them that, you know, number one, we wanted to really honor the house by not replicating it in any sense, but at the same time, number two, we wanted to connect uh, to some aspects of the house and the sort of history of the Dutch farmstead. So the building is thought of as, um, in fact, two volumes that are bridged by one roof. And those volumes are roughly the position of former barns on the property. Um, so this area is an interesting area. It, this photo on the upper left sort of captures that moment where the, the grid in Brooklyn was extending across the farmland of what was once the red basket of the United States. Um, Long Island used to be, you know, before the advent of the railroads, the kind of major um, food producing area. Now what remains is a little triangle, a funny little triangle of history submerged six feet below the adjacent context because when Robert Moses drained the salt marshes, he basically raised the level of the city. So you have this real palpable sense of entering into a sort of historical space. Um, the old house is very beautiful, and we were struck by um, the cabinet you see on your upper left. Um, the Dutch used color sparingly when it was expensive, and so it was really exciting for us to open this cabinet, find this orange, um, of course, as you know, the, the, the color of uh, House of Holland, uh, House of Orange. Um, on the bottom left, in other photos, you see also the relationship between windows and glazing and surfaces, like ceilings and walls, which really, being so adjacent, really makes these spaces feel very luminous. Um, we are also interested in the idea of the, the portal as, um, as, as manifested in the uh, sort of Dutch paintings of the 17th century. The Dutch interior, which some say was sort of is the invention of the home, idea of home as we know it, really created uh, in some cases an alternation of interior and exterior spaces or a series of kind of spaces en filade, one after the other without the corridors that really created this sense of uh, layering and depth. And so we proposed to create the building as a kind of a portal between a contemporary kind of not very great uh, context with a lot of auto body shops, very loud and noisy, you know, intersection, and, and, and the house, creating a sort of a buffer. So the building is really comprised of two, two volumes. It's uh, on the right, a uh, more, more public volume with a flexible space, a little gift shop, and a, and a gallery. And at the upper level of that volume houses a caretaker. And then on the left, an administration wing. And so you can walk right through this portal under this skylight. Um, and basically get to the house from which the view of the building is a bit more kind of demure as it kind of steps down. So we've been a little bit in limbo waiting for funding to be increased, but all approvals are there and it's ready to go. So if anyone has $4 million, please see me after the. 
Um, much more recently, ADO, which stands for Amalgamated Drawing Office, um, we just finished this for uh, MINI, which is uh, the car company owned by BMW. It's a new initiative for MINI um, to basically um, reposition themselves as a design company rather than a car company. Um, like many car companies, they're aware that cars are kind of um, you know, less and less interesting to, to young people, um, but also less and less important to the city. And MINI has always been a kind of design company. In fact, ADO was the name of the design office that produced the first MINI in the, in the 50s. So they came to us and asked us to uh, repurpose this uh, one-story warehouse in Greenpoint, which is at the edge of Williamsburg in Brooklyn, a kind of a inter interesting emerging area with still a lot of uh, fabrication shops, but also you know great bars and restaurants, sort of poised, poised for gentrification probably, but still a manufacturing zone, so in fact limited. That's our project. No, that's the, that's the original project. That's the original building. Um, kind of an, an interesting one-story uh, warehouse, but we were interested in some aspects of it. Um, so we we cut into it, cut a corner out, and cut in a lot of windows, but we decided that our ethos uh, for this uh, renovation would be to try to leave as much untouched as possible. Um, even the graffiti, um, when we trenched for electrical to the floor, we would expose that. We, we really, it took a long time to develop our attitude, but we decided, not just because of budget, we wanted somehow for this building not to appear like a UFO that had landed into kind of a, you know, a vibrant um, manufacturing context, but one that really could kind of fit in through uh, the revealing of a series of traces. So in, let's see if I can point. Um, yeah. So in, in the middle here is um, what we call a free space. So people can walk into this and hang out and work uh, for free. There's kind of free Wi-Fi. So basically um, ADO wants people just to you know, walk off the street and then decide to go into the restaurant, uh, which we've just completed, or a little shop, or the design academy, which is the heart of the, of the building. So the design academy is going to host a series of symposia and exhibitions and so on, and has a designer in residence right now, Stephen Burks. In fact, last weekend they held their first, uh, called Utopia and Dystopia, um, and they used this space for a kind of 500 seat auditorium. But this will be used as an accelerator that will basically host a series of startups um, developing new hardware and software solutions that will improve city life. So MINI is basically partnering with a joint vent, uh, in a joint venture with um, Venture Capital to kind of untap uh, new talent and find new, new products and services um, for the future. It's a kind of a flexible gallery. And then this is a sort of design studio where anyone or designers can basically be vetted but also uh, eventually rent a desk there and um, use some, some very nice tools you know, all kinds of, not as nice as the one David and Brian are, are, are designing right now, but a smaller version of it. Um, so we're excited that it has so, you know, so many programs. Um, so there you see, and it's, it's designed to be very, very sort of flexible. There's a, we, we jokingly call this the curtain wall. It has a, a curtain on either side of it, and there's a flexible furniture basically that uh, allows the space to be transformed. So, here, here's how the um, Wythe Avenue basically um, cuts into the building, allowing for the main entry to be sort of quite clear. Um, and this is what we did with the bricks. So we asked them to um, re reuse, very carefully take apart the bricks that had the graffiti on them and then rebuild the walls uh, with them. So you'll see here in the corner the remnants of the brick. So around every new window too, there's sort of a blush of um, you know, the new brick or the reconstituted brick and the old graffiti. Of course, we realize this is all pointless in the end because they're just going to graffiti over the whole thing. So, but for this moment, at least, it's, um, it's at that sort of tenuous moment, you know, when you can still read the intention. Um, so this was, you know, at the opening, it's still not 100% complete. There's a tree missing, but um, this bench is made with two, two materials, and it kind of is emblematic for us of how we approach the project, never sort of one single thing, one, one single material. So here you see a little animated drawing that uh, there's a little car arriving. There he is, just to help you because it's very subtle. <laughs> but it, it's sort of, uh, we're trying to, we've been working on this idea of living drawings in the office. That's something we need to take a lot further. But we have a series of projects that are now um, represented as a sort of a living drawing. We're not sure yet what that means. Right now it's simply showing uh, reconfiguration. 
So um, here you see a view with uh, some benches by Moss Architects. Um, it's basically a platform for designers, so there are a lot of people involved. Um, London's Assemble is, uh, has started to build a factory in here where they're producing um, tiles. Um, David Burns spoke there, John Maeda, Yves Behar. It's going to be an exciting sort of place for, for innovation. Now, one of the things we did, you can sort of see the hint of it here, is that we built a large periscope. Um, and I'll, I'll be able to show this a bit um, more with some other slides. But it's basically a large skylight that um, has two mirrors on it that um, reflect the views of the um, Brooklyn and Manhattan skyline. This is the restaurant. Um, that looks pretty bare here, but it's, it's, it's uh, run by Klaus Meyer of Noma from Copenhagen and Frederick Berselius, so it's kind of a, you know, interesting sort of chef uh, that forages. Um, here's a window cut looking down, down White Avenue. So here you can see we just left, you know, we left the bricks as, it, as, as they are. Um, and basically we had a very kind of light touch um, in, in this space. So here's the little books, the little um, design store. Now, in, in the rear of the building, we took the roof off of one building and we introduced a steel frame. This is where Assemble architects are building their little factory. And the idea is to just you know, allow for a space for innovation or, or dining, and, as, you know, as, the, as the case may be. Um, but again, like just by, by removing the roof, uh, we tried to transform into a space that's more like an armature for, for future designers to, to appropriate. So the Periscope emerged out of um, basically an impossible challenge. The client wanted us to build a, a level on the roof, and we concluded that because of zoning and budget and accessibility and so on, we just couldn't. They really wanted to see Manhattan, because from Munich, the perception was they weren't sure about Brooklyn. They wanted to see Manhattan, so we said, well, what if we just bring the, you know, the view of Manhattan into the building? Um, but then we realized, why is Manhattan that important? So we, and also, we were very concerned that the view of Manhattan will be blocked by future development. So there was one view we knew that was guaranteed, which was the view down Wythe Avenue. So we proposed to build a periscope, basically, that um, reflects the two and joins the two skylines together into sort of one unfamiliar skyline. And then we proposed, well, why not do something with a roof? So they hired an artist. And this is a reflection of the roof. Uh, the artist, Mike Perry, has painted, painted the roof. And in the future, it may be possible to have performances on the roof and really create a very disembodied um, you know, sense of orientation. So there you see the cut. Here you see the periscope. There's basically he painted wherever you could see. Um, unfortunately, they didn't allow us to move one mechanical rooftop unit, which is a, <laughs> a real pity. Um, these photos don't quite, it's hard to see, but you, you get it it's from some vantage points, a view of the skyline of um, Brooklyn and Manhattan um, combining. So that should be open in a week or two while we get our final uh, TCO. So last two projects um, out of the 13. They both happen to be in China. Um, they both happen to be in a sense, be the same project because for this library competition, we decided to kind of redo this much earlier uh, house project. And they're both too big, uh, we thought. And so our design strategies evolved from basically trying to make them feel more intimate and more uh, domestic. On the left is a house that's a 10,000 square foot house as part of the um, Ordos, Ordos 100 uh, project that you may have heard of, um, curated by Ai Weiwei, the um, Chinese artist, and a 100 firms from across the world selected by Herzog and de Meuron. Um, all of us basically from, it's like a UN of firms except no Chinese firms, which is maybe Ai Weiwei's kind of joke on, on the situation. So our, our project, we call it Villa Villa because it, in a sense it's a villa inside a villa. And um, it emerges from thinking about um, the kind of uh, very tough climate of Inner Mongolia where the house is situated. This, by the way, is a model showing, I think at the midterm as it were, um, when we all came together, uh, each put our house on the on the lot. I think ours is. I can't even see it. There's another photo coming up. Oh, wait. Oh yeah, that's ours. <laughs> so the project's really strange because all the houses are 10,000 square feet, um, which is crazy, and they're so close to each other, which one could say is part of its interest, but maybe also kind of its um, you know extreme extreme nature. So. Here's, basically, Ai Weiwei has been exhibiting the, uh, the uh, sort of wood model of the house. This is in the Kunsthaus Bregenz uh, space you may know by Zoom tour. There's ours again in the foreground. Very simple. There are a lot of really exciting ones. Ours is very, very simple. Um, but it emerged from thinking about the climate. Um, you know, you get this incredible range, minus four degrees Fahrenheit in winter, and basically a desert, quite hot in summer. So nobody really uses the outdoors. 
so we thought, well, what if the house, we could think of it as kind of a, a space that has two different thermal qualities. One where you live within kind of a heated house, and the other where you live sort of um, in, in between the insulation, as it were. And we began to think of this as the inner and the outer house. So the inner house um, is heated and conditioned, it's comfortable. Um, it's also the size of house we thought was reasonable. Um, the outer house is basically a less expensive space. It's not heated or conditioned. It's just passively conditioned. It's, it's uh, unrefined. It's rough. It has almost no views to the outdoors, just skylight views. Um, so the inner house is comprised of a series of three volumes that address the programmatic needs. On the ground floor, um, the car garage, <laughs> the um, uh, guest bedroom, and a little uh, uh, study. And then the kitchen, living, and dining on the middle floor, and then four bedrooms on the top. And um, these all combine together to create a series of overlapping terraces. Um, but the goal was really to create a kind of a thermal a logic for this. So we work with Arab engineers to understand how to dissipate heat intentionally from the inner house to the outer house. So the inner house has basically, and this is a, mo uh, this is a 1 to 7.5 scale model we built for the Seoul Design Olympiad in 2008. So it's basically a model it's like 10, 10 feet tall, something like that, where we turned the, the walls into glass just so we could read the temperature um, uh, variations. Red is warm, uh, blue is cold. So this is a minus 20 degrees Celsius day. Um, for the thermal modeling, which showed, showed us that heat would dissipate from the inner house to the outer house because we used single pane glazing um, in, across that divide. And the idea is you could heat up the outer house by simply opening those doors or just Willfully, the, the inefficiency was built in so, so that, in fact, overall, it was a very efficient house. Um, also, we're, we're not very fond of stacking things in a kind of little new way, so we use parametric modeling to basically create the simplest possible structure by um, a, aligning the geometries of the three different houses such that they resulted only in four columns and a maximum nine meter span of concrete beams to the perimeter. So it's a very simple construction. But ultimately, it wasn't only about efficiency. We were really interested in the idea that there are two different kinds of space. The outer house, which really would allow for different kinds of functions, um, and then the inner house, which would allow for others. Windows from the inner house would view the outside or the inner or the outer house and be treated equivalently. So here you have the four bedrooms, each with their own sort of terraces due to the stacking. So the house is quite demure at some level. But from the inside, it provides a series of very different spaces. Um, and we cheated here. We, we're not supposed to have a window to the outside from the inner house or the outer house. Yeah, I even get confused. It's a, like a 10-year-old project. Um, but again, it was very important for us to um, establish those two different kinds of spaces and recognition of the fact that you know, people don't really hang out outside in this very extreme climate. So when we were invited to participate in um, competition for a library in Shanghai last summer, uh, the concept phase. Um, my partner Mimi allowed us to sneak in because she was under 45. Um, it was a young architects competition, just <laughs> full disclosure. Um, we decided we were very interested still in this, this idea of this alternating kind of uh, space. Um, and we wanted the very large museum, I mean library, 1.1 million square foot library, to feel smaller. So for starters, we tucked in quite a bit of the program under a plinth. But then we tried to create the most compact form possible on the site um, that would allow people to always be a certain distance uh, from the perimeter and also to, to make this very kind of big uh, you know, building feel interconnected. So as you'll see when I, when I get into it in a second, it's comprised of compact floors that contain um, things like uh, you know, offices, the stacks, and things like that, also structural Verendale beams, and open floors, which are kind of uh, open reading rooms. So, we placed the building in such a way as to create a kind of strong connection between its context in Shanghai and the Century Park and created a very kind of large um, you know, new park. But the idea too was to bring greenery at every level. Uh, and this comes from a very old, uh, the oldest library in China, which is called Tian Yi Ge, um, in which the open floors, uh, the open, sorry, the reading room is connected to a garden and the archive um, is above it. So we inverted that and thought of it as a kind of spatial paradigm that we could replicate in the building. Um, so here you see the kind of compact floor and the open floor. And we repeated those compact floors, basically allowing kind of very simple spaces, the patio, the living room, um, atelier, and study to be interconnected between them. So 
the same time, we wanted this all to feel interconnected. So a series of voids uh, allow for the interconnection of these spaces through very slow stepped, uh, uh, stepped ramps and other, other kind of uh, auditoria-like uh, step seating to create basically a stacking of voids, very much like um, what we did in the house in Ordos, um, but I guess at a, at, a, at a different scale. So starting with the ground floor, this is sort of tucked under the landscape with a very with a small courtyard around which the um, children's library and the elderly library is, is, is organized and a conference center. Um, the plinth level basically um, is one kind of large patio directly accessible from, from the, the garden. Um, and then, you know, you rise up and you go to the um, living room level, sorry, the, um, the atelier level, and finally the study at the, at the top. What I'm skipping are all the plans of the space of the floors that basically comprise the sandwich. So um, each of these uh, floor plans is kind of alternating with a much denser floor plan with a very tight column grid, which has basically all the small, uh, small rooms, um, offices, and so on, and stacks. And some of this you can kind of see in this, this section here, which um, shows you these sort of compact floors and how we wanted, by creating these compact floors, we wanted them to read as a floor. Um, and make a, what is a really a nine-story or I forget maybe ten-story building feel just like a four-story building at a different scale, where these connections basically could you know could occur. So here's a physical model um, showing also our idea for the envelope a little bit, which I'll get into. Um, at the very top, uh, there were three kind of um, different government entities that wanted offices. So we thought, well, let's give them. Absolute equality, uh, so everybody has their own office looking at the very, very top. So each of the sort of, uh, the shapes of each of these floors is dictated to some extent by the, in a sense by the program and the orientation to the, to the city. So the skin was something that we were quite interested in. Um, well, so here you see a view uh, from the sort of patio level coming up past one of the compact floors into um, the living room level. What you see in the skin is that there's actually a, gla a, gla a glazed inner uh, layer with planting uh, beyond, and then beyond that, there's a layer of a terracotta screen, um, basically modulating the, the light um, that comes into the library. So this screen is thought of as a series of panels made of terracotta, which was actually the original printing uh, material uh, made in original books in China, that's basically hung from a, a cable net structure. Um, so basically the terracotta is raw, red terracotta on the inside and glazed on the outside to create a kind of, a, you know, very constantly changing um, envelope depending on the, on, on, on the time of day. So in conclusion, we think that as, as the context of our, our work is changing, as climate is changing, demographics are changing, the way we live and work uh, is changing, we want to imagine uh, buildings and almost buildings that are, are, that are in turn open to change. Could architecture remain incomplete? Could it remain incomplete in a positive way, open to landscape, um, less defined? Could buildings and public spaces uh, provoke appropriation and remain open-ended in their use? And finally, could our work embrace ambiguity, opening up architecture to changing readings and perceptions um, that continues to uh, resonate with evolving culture? So as we look towards the future, should we embrace the positive aspects in the uncertainty of our discipline, if not those of our times. Thank you. Thanks for sticking it out. It's more than an hour. <laughs>
I, I love that question. I haven't thought about it so clearly, but I think our disobedience uh, emerges over time and, um, because it really comes from a kind of rewriting of the program or the brief, shall we say, as an architectural brief. Um, and often the client's brief may not actually have the right information. It might really just be a list of uh, space types that they think they need, but often by the end of the project that is already obsolete, uh, not to mention once the building is built. Um, so we look at it kind of more holistically and try to see, well, you know, is there a way to be more open-ended about it? And often that results in a kind of a, a proposal for a space that wasn't in the program, but that maybe can address uh, some of their needs. So the Wyckoff House Museum, you know, the covered sort of portal came from a need that, you know, they, they were constantly uh, paying for tents uh, on, on their, their lawn, um, using up, you know, the landscape area. And we thought, well, you know, in the 17th century, and the, the Dutch farmers and settlers would have been running from one barn building to another outside, so why not create a building that doesn't have a contiguous interior that replicates that feeling um, and at the same time provide for this sort of covered space. Um, so it, it came out of really research and thinking about use, but it, it also comes from a healthy suspicion of the idea of program. That was a softball. I need harder questions. <laughs> Well, um, some of that shift has to do with the evolving, uh, just getting older at <laughs> some level and having bigger problems to solve. But the, what remains sort of consistent for us across that kind of stretch of, of projects would be, you know, first of all, a, a desire to create something with a very economical means, whether it's physical or, you know, physical or financial um, or conceptual. So being very reductive at some level about things like materials, about you know, how many ideas are there in a project. So for instance, the bamboo, we kind of stuck to one material. Can we create wall, canopy, you know, everything with, with one material? And that led us to the bamboo, uh, rather than starting with the bamboo and saying, what can bamboo do for us? Um, so here, of course, it's a very different sort of problem, but again, there's one spatial idea. Um, and we're always trying to pare, you know, pare down to one spatial idea that will in turn, hopefully, provide a richness of experience. So in, in Canopy, the bamboo is one thing, but there are four different microclimates. And we achieved that sort of invisibly with water systems, right? So actually it felt very different, it sounded very different. So the, the MO really is a kind of uh, inefficient process of, of you know, investigation down to what we thought, what we think of as a little bit more essential. Um, but it's been one kind of continuum for us, you know, from our vantage point. Sure. <laughs> Oh, sure. Right. So we're a small practice. My partner Mimi and I uh, are the principals. We're about 12 people. Um, we, we, that's who we are, I guess. Um, we don't think of our kind of design process in terms of options so much as kind of explorations that are defined by a set of hypothetical parameters. So for instance, we'll say, what if we privilege one aspect of the project? Let's think of it as urban connections. We develop an idea. What if we think about economy? Or what if we think about, uh, I don't know, what ha whatever it happens to be in that case. And so we try to test the design process through very clearly framed experiments. But all, you know, at some level too, we're just kind of um, you know, using our instinct as well in order to evaluate the, these experiments. So we use a lot of, I mean, my, my medium, my favorite medium is a pencil and in by 11 piece of paper. And I'm always physically drawing, drawing diagrams, whatever it is, perspectives, sections, details. So I, I still very much am connected to drawing personally, but as an office we build a lot of models and then we go very quickly into um, what we think is the simplest iteration that solves the problem, the, the simplest possible. And 
often our clients have been part of that discussion or our stakeholders, you know, and I think that, you know, as architects, we're always in a position to communicate um, and create design consensus through, well, consensus through design. So it, when the weave, the weave expands to everybody who's involved in the project, it's, you know, everyone has to believe in it to pull it off. Um, so I'm not sure, I know the softball has gotten harder, but I'm not sure if I've, <laughs> if I've fully answered the question, and maybe I don't know the answer to, to it myself. <laughs> well, that's the goal. Actually, that's the goal. Is we're not really interested in the elements per se, but in fact how they can contribute to larger dominant spatial structures or, or ideas. So, and we teach this way too a lot with our students. So we're very interested in, in them maybe starting with these simple constructs, but through hybridization, shifting and changing of scale, whatever, creating a kind of an architectural vocabulary that is very kind of cohesive. So actually that is the goal, to come up with hybrid elements. Um, no, we haven't named uh, hybrids yet because our hope is that all the resulting kind of experiments, uh, you know, are, are sort of that. Um, this has been sort of a thread through our work, even from our graduate school days, some thinking, you know, uh, as students, but it's become more and more evident to us as we're working on a book and trying to think about how, how to, you know, uh, frame our connection to the discipline at large and, and history more, more broadly. Like, what is our connection to the history of architecture? Brian was once a student. Well, we're suspicious of, I mean, this is one of the few renderings I'm showing, we're suspicious of renderings, um, we love drawings, we're suspicious of animations and sort of fixed vantage point, but we love the idea that we can show life and appropriation and we can sort of anticipate how um, projects might evolve. So we're not sure if these living drawings will only show anticipated use and transformation or if there will be some sort of shift in the um, representation itself. So we're testing different ways of making the drawing come alive, um, so it's not, we're not sure, actually. We've, we've, we've done about four or five, and we're working on it in our office. Um, we, we're just we're interested to see where it goes, but we love the idea of the drawing com coming alive, um, representing something beyond just the regulation of space, if you will. Um, if anybody has any ideas, we're, it's very much a fertile period right now where we're not sure where this is going. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe one day. It'll drive contractors crazy. <laughs> yeah. Real students? <laughs> How about the students I saw today? Where are you all? You had questions. I see one there. It's 
I mean, I think it's probably boring to talk about constraints, which all architects face. Um, they're very real. They're real, and, and often we're, we're, our ambitions are far outweighing our budgets. <laughs> so, like for instance, with the starting with the bamboo canopy. I mean, you, some of you may know, but the budget has hardly changed every year. It's like I think um, maybe it's fifty or sixty thousand dollars, but the space is thirty thousand square feet, um, and, and we wanted to create not an object, not a liner, not a series of you know, field of things. We want to create a whole environment. So we had to use bamboo, and in fact, the bamboo was very inexpensive. We, we, um, we got 11,000 poles of bamboo from Dudley, Georgia, in fact. So that project came from here. I just remembered this. Um, and we, really what we paid for were, was labor. We wanted to make sure our, our students were paid um, because it was from grueling work. And so we, you know, we made that calculus at the very beginning, and we submitted a budget as part of our competition entry, and we had we stuck to it. We didn't go over our budget. So, but it was really born out of that desire, and I think now it's become more of an ethos, you know. And it's more that we just, you know, we're not interested in architecture that's cinegraphic, that has a million ideas um, or a million materials. It doesn't move us. So it's just personal. We want to to see if we can, and we don't see it as reductivist because we want it to be pleasurable, and you know, um, but we want to see what what can we do, you know, with with, with less. And so for us, that existing building, ADO, I mean, if you look closely, it's fascinating. And I haven't been able to show you some details, um, but you know, I mentioned the sort of trenching of the electrical floor. I guess most of us and us in other projects, we just cover that up. We put a new um, top coat of whatever, inch and a half, two inches of concrete. But we convinced the client, let's just leave it. It's a trace. And so that became like a scar and kind of an interesting story. So now, I was telling David and Brian last night, we're really interested in renovations <laughs> because there's so much you know, to do. And I could argue, too, that every project's a renovation at some level. You know, there's an existing ground plane, there's a site or whatever. There's, there are things you know, uh, to, to interfere within. And that's something we're very interested in identifying and situating the project within a set of parameters that we can you know, uh, interfere and, and celebrate, if possible. We're definitely um, suspicious of the dominance of the tool in, in architectural thinking um, and sort of perceive the situation we're in now as a kind of fantasy, you know, um, Baroque maybe interest in complexity for its own sake, but we are actually interested in complexity, but um, I guess not if it's dominated by the tools we use. You know, we're, we're very interested in using all those tools, um, but also trying to make sure we're in control, somewhat, somewhat in control of them. students come on one for the record <laughs> so, yeah. I'll give you an A <laughs> I'll give the whole thing over again. <laughs> 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 I was